God bless you this morning. I want to thank you for joining me for another time of word, inspiration, and enrichment. I am so grateful that I have the privilege of being able to pour into you, to encourage you, to build you up, and to establish you in all that is good. It is a, a marvelous benefit of being able to live life as an encourager, as one who lifts people to help push them along and uh, move them along in their life. So I'm certainly grateful for that and looking forward to what we shall share today. Before we get into the word, we certainly want to pray for our time together. And then we will share based on the subject that you have very likely seen already is for today. So let us pray together. Our Father, we thank you. We thank you that you have given us very marvelous perspective to establish our way. We thank you that when we believe that which is good, true, right, wholesome, beautiful, our lives may be established to be profoundly, profoundly exceptional in your sight and ultimately pleasing to you. Today, let us receive a word of truth and clarity that moves us in that direction no more. Ultimately, to the praise of your glory, but also that we might be blessed, that we might be enriched, that we might be rewarded, that we might be inspired, inspired and established in the truth. And so we give you name, the glory, honor, and the praise. Ask that you would word our mouth, give us ears to hear, hearts to receive, and bodies to act upon, minds to believe, think, wills to desire, and emotions to feel and behave consistent with. This we pray in the glorious name of Christ Jesus. Amen. All right, I want to share today from the subject that you've already seen, intentional for the will. Now you say, what, what does that mean? <laughs> you know I'm going to tell you. <laughs> so in our time of studying the word of God on Thursday nights, we are going through the Gospel of John, and we have come to a place which we've kind of passed uh, already, but come to a place where we've talked about John the Baptist being approached by some of his disciples and a Jew who wanted to bring up this perspective of the fact that Jesus whom John had testified about early on being the Christ Jesus was not only baptizing more even though Jesus didn't do any baptizing Jesus was baptizing more people than John and the people were instead going to Jesus in people were going to Jesus instead of John and they thought that was a problem they thought that was bad why? They had a certain view of John, obviously that he didn't have it himself, but that was inconsistent with the will of God for John, the purpose that John had come. Let's go there for a brief moment and look at it. And John responded to them with a very unique, interesting perspective to let them know that uh, this, this ain't got nothing to do with me. And so he exalts Christ, not himself. They were trying to exalt him, but he exalted Christ. Let's see what John says here. We're going to start uh, John 3 and 22. I'll read and, and just give some perspective here thereafter. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean country, and he remained there 
with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing at Anon near Salim, because water was plentiful there, and people were coming and being baptized, for John had not yet been put in prison. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing, and all are going to him. John answered, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of bride is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son, and he gives all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. That's a pretty very... Um, robust response to this idea of exalting John beyond measure. What John does is he ultimately not only exalts Christ, but he elevates the truth about who Christ is versus who uh, John himself is and even who we are. Ultimately, what John, what we can see from what John is saying here that is consistent with what we are talking about today is this. God has sent us for a purpose, a specific purpose. And to do anything contrary to that purpose is of no value. Hmm. It would be of no value for John to take credit here that does not belong to him. He said, look, I came to do what I was supposed to do. Now that I have done what I was supposed to do, let him continue on. It is about him in the first place. What I came to do was about him. It wasn't about me. It wasn't about anything I would gain. Do I get something from it? I'm sure. But it's not about what I gain. Hmm. So, in that, we begin to talk about, as a, as a result of our study in these aspects, we begin to talk about, uh, you know, looking at, what does it mean to exalt yourself? How do you, what, what is that line that you cross from humility to pride, from um, really taking care of yourself, sustaining yourself, to actually being self-centered, selfishly ambitious, all those things. We've talked about that. And so as a result of these thought processes and some conversation, it came up about how intentional we have to be for God's will because of what Christ did. Now let's go over to Philippians 2 where we'll begin with the motivation for our text today. It says Philippians 2 and 1. And we may have talked about this in a previous message, but hey, it don't hurt <laughs> to repeat it. Repetition is a true reward to us. All right. So. Chapter 2, verse 1. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind. Same mind. Having the same love. Being in full accord and of one mind. Hmm. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Watch this. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now, it says some things about uh, Jesus um, 
been highly exalted and things of that sort. We'll come back to that uh, at another point. But I want to stop here because this is where the, the beauty of being intentional for the will is important. Now, I want to jump over to Hebrews real briefly. And then we're going to come back because Hebrews says something to us that's very important with regard to the perspective we will follow related to this text. Oh, Hebrews 10. <laughs> Listen, mm. I want to read uh, 1 down to about 7. Hmm. I might read a little more after we explain this a little bit. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifice that are continued offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered since the worshipers have once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins? But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year, for it is possible for the blood of it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Now, we're not going to get into all the historical perspective of what's said before here, but I want you to hear right here at this point. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Okay? Let's stop here real quickly and give some perspective. In other words, it is impossible for there to be anything of this earth that comes from this earth rather than heaven to pay for the penalty of sin and to satisfy God's wrath and to wipe it away so that we can be free from that debt of having to pay for sin and satisfy God's wrath so that we can now be free to live righteously. So the 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 basis of this uh, text that we just read, this portion we just read, was talking about, when I get into the historical context, but I just want to say, it was talking about the sacrifices that Israel would have to make on a regular basis and saying, hey, these sacrifices were made as in order to be an awareness to us of what it is that God expects, but this could not actually satisfy what God expected. It couldn't. So it was to be a, a foreshadow, something to be an illustration of that which was to come, which now we get into where Jesus comes in the picture. So it says, consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, this is Jesus talking. Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. Now, let me go ahead and, and continue. When he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings, these offered according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I've come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Now listen, this goes back, let's go back to Philippians 2. It says here that we should have a certain mind. What is that mind? That is in Christ, among ourselves. What was the mind? He, he, though he was God, he didn't count having to not behave as God as robbery of his identity. Okay? Nor did he consider the fact that he was God and he was not behaving as God because he was in the likeness of, of, of mankind. That, okay, I want that. I want that status that comes with that. He didn't consider that as something to be grasped. Why? Because he emptied himself. He took on the form of a servant. He was born in the likeness of men. Found in human form. He humbled himself being coming obedient to the point of death. The death on the cross, it says. But he was the once for all sacrifice that could actually take away sin. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. He was a once for all sacrifice that could actually satisfy God's wrath. That could actually pay the penalty 
for sinful nature that can wipe away the debt of all mankind once for all. Huh? Yes. And therefore we are able to be sanctified, set apart unto God for him. Hmm. Listen carefully. What Paul is saying to the Philippians and also to us as we observe this is the mind that we should have that Christ had is one that is intentional for the will. Intentional for the will of God. Listen, Jesus was God. And I guarantee you, we go look at the Gospels. There were many opportunities where someone could literally, I just tell you the truth, literally exalt him in his God nature. There was one time where it said that perceiving that they were going to come and take him and make him king, that he withdrew from them. What? Oh, he had plenty of opportunities. He had done many things. Even John says there was many things that he did that were not even written in John's gospel. He said it's so much that I don't think even the books of the world could contain it. Jesus had many opportunities to grasp that God man status and be lifted up and exalted. But he counted that not something to be grasped. Hmm. What, what, what you trying to say, Brother Leo? In living this life, it is not important for us in any way, shape, form, or fashion to give regard to what satisfies us. Why? Let's go over to Revelation 4 real briefly. Why? It is because. Worthy are you, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Mm. By your will they existed and were created. In other words, now this is in heaven, so it looks past tense. <laughs> so, so for us, it is to look into this heavenly reality and see the purpose of all things. In the King James Version, it's for, it says, for thy pleasure they are and were created. So God's will and God's pleasure are very similar, meaning the satisfaction of his will is critical. He wants to be pleased. Guess what? All things were created. That means you and me, you and me, you and me were created by him. And so for his will, according to his will, we were created. We exist. Because of his will. We were created for his will. We exist for his will. We were created by his will. And guess what? We should live our lives intentional for his will. Intentional for the will of God. Yes. And when we do that, let's go back over and see what happened for Christ. It says, therefore, in, in Philippians 2 and 9, Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth, and, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now you say, what's that got to do with me, Brother Leo? Here's what it got to do with you. Here's what it has to do with you. As he was rewarded, exalted, as God gave him a measure of recognition appropriate to his obedience, so, I got excited, y'all, so will you receive a measure of reward consistent with your obedience. So will I. Huh. Yes. And we can have confidence in God doing so to the praise of his glory and to our benefit. Why? Because we're intentional. See, so don't lose focus on what it is that you're supposed to do. Don't get sidetracked by things that seem to satisfy you. My God today. Just be intentional for his will. Let nothing distract you. Uh, uh, one of the writers, it's one of the, the uh, epistle writers, I think it was Paul, said, who did hinder you that you should not be followers of that which is good? 
In other words, let no one, why is it that we allow people to do this? Let no one hinder you, hinder me from being intentional for God's will. That's good. Mm. Let's go over to 1 Peter. I believe it is the fourth chapter. Yes, it is. It says, since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves in the same way of thinking. Isn't that similar to what he just said in the, the second chapter of Philippians? Have the same mind that was in him. <laughs> oh, yes. Mm. And when you do that, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So the things that come to you that, that make you uncomfortable, the things that come to you that seem to challenge you and to press upon you, the things that come to you that cause you to feel like you may come, become a little distressed. Hallelujah. These things, understand, they are a measurement. They are an awareness that something good has happened. What is that? Mm, you have ceased from sin. But not only have you ceased from sin, you have ceased from sin so as to live for the rest of your time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. Hallelujah. Yes. See, you, you got to understand because of what Christ Jesus did, because of his example, because of his glorification. Now, not only should we be intentional for the will of God. Now we have the absolute ability through our receiving him. But you see, we read over that in John. Mm. John said it for us. He said it. He said it at the very end. I don't know if you saw it, but I'll go ahead and say it to you. He said, listen. He said, he bears, with, okay, here we go. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. God's will is true. God's purpose is true. The fact that God created us and by his will we exist is true. <laughs> Mm. For he whom God has sent utters the word of God. That's talking about Jesus. And for he gives the spirit without measure. That's God giving the spirit to Jesus without measure. The father loves the son and has given all things into his head. Whoever believes in the son has eternal life. Woo! Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. So guess what? Right here we get to see that when we receive, believe, and therefore show that belief through our obedience, it is the essence of us being intentional for the will of God. And when we do so, we do not live for our passions, but for his pleasure, for his will. And there's such great reward for Jesus has shown us right there in Philippians 2. The writer gives us to understand that when you don't grasp the things that seem to be grasped, the things that people bring to you that would exalt you above measure, that would kick you off of the path that God has assigned to you, that would destroy your focus. When you don't give regard to that and you remain obedient, become a servant of the will of God, a servant of the passions of the truth, not the passions of your own heart. Then you see on the other side, as Jesus was exalted and glorified and received the reward, so will we. That's the point. See, he's given us the example. Yes? See, it's not about, listen to me carefully, it's not about believing on Christ from this a uh, very, um, uh, what's the word I want to use? This very uh, good feeling, emotional desire and excitement. It is believing on him in the sense that the power of his life, his obedience, his submission and his sacrifice and the very glorification that God has given him now acts as a power in and through us. And so we must be intentional about the will of God because there was one who was intentional about it and made it possible for us to completely, fully walk in it to the praise of his glory, but also to the rewarding and benefit of our life. Not just in the life to come, but even here now. 
So, will you be intentional for the will of God? I certainly desire to be, and I certainly seek to be. But will you be intentional for the will of God? For if you are, just know, God's got a blessing for you. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you. Oh, I pray that there was diligence in the delivery of this word. I pray that anything of me that could be a distraction and even a means by which others may not receive, that it will not be. Let that which has gone forth, your word, your truth, according to your word, be as you have purpose, which is it will accomplish that which you set it to accomplish. Give every person under the sound of my voice to be intentional for the will of God that you have established for their lives. And let them look to Christ Jesus. Let them receive his testimony. Let them believe on him and obey that they might see the true benefit and blessing of doing so. That their lives may be transformed. That the lives of others may be transformed. That they may be blessed to be a blessing. Now, bless us as we leave here, that we may be established in what is good, wholesome, and fruitful, and we may give greatly with nothing holding us back, for there is no better way to live. We praise you in the glorious name of Christ Jesus, and we say thank you, Lord. Amen. You go in peace. Be blessed to be a blessing.